right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to another virtual shadowing session with Dental Shadowers. Um, my name is Crystal, and today I'm facilitating the session with Dr. Greenberg. Um, he is a general dentist who is currently an implantology fellow um, in the general practice residency program. And whenever, Dr. Greenberg, you're ready, you can take the floor. All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to speak to you all. Um, so I tried to gear this presentation more towards pre-dentals. Um, obviously, you know, it's important to learn dentistry, but it's also important to get into dental school and have that motivation to continue pursuing different forms of education along the way. So um, I, this presentation is kind of two part. The first part is going to be my journey um, into dentistry. So what I had to do to get into the schools that I got into um, and ultimately um, the school that I ended up choosing. And then the second part of it is what I'm doing now. Um, so I'm a, a general practice resident. Um, I actually finished my GPR um, last year and I stayed on as an implantology fellow to further my education. I'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, but for now, um, <clears throat> I'm going to take you through my journey. Um, a lot of you can hopefully relate to this because you're in college and you're either going to the application cycle or you're in the application cycle or you're interviewing now. So um, hopefully you can take some pearls out of this. All right. <clears throat> so I went to undergrad at Binghamton University. It's a medium sized upstate school in New York. Um, this was my, my freshman year dorm. Um, obviously I looked a lot different back then. Um, but I went into college not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I had a, a whole family of people in the medical profession. Um, I had one uncle that was a dentist, uh, but I shadowed dental, I shadowed dermatology, I shadowed my dad's an optometrist, so I shadowed him. Um, I shadowed, um, um, just, uh, internist. I, I basically did all types of shadowing. Um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I have always been the person that takes opportunities when they're presented. Um, I think everyone should be open-minded like that. And that, um, you know, whenever you're given an opportunity to do something, you know, the worst thing that happens if you say yes is you don't like it and you can pivot. But a lot of the times those opportunities don't come up, come up often. Um, so I ended up graduate, graduating as an accounting major, which I had no idea I was going to do when I entered freshman year at Binghamton. Um, again, I, I came in with some credits from, from uh, high school, and a lot of my friends were in the business school. They said, the business school is great. Do it. Okay. So I was like, you know what? Let me just apply. Let me say that everyone's saying how hard it is to get in. I got in. So I was like, okay, you know what? Let, maybe, let, me, let me just see if I like that right? It's just a major in college. How many times have we changed majors? Everyone probably changes majors all the time. So I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do it. So I ended up graduating with a degree in accounting. Um, this is now, while I was there, I realized, you know, I could potentially graduate in three years. I talked to my advisor at school and they were like, you could graduate in three years. I said, great. So um, they said, we have this program you can stay for four years, but you do a one-year MBA program. So I said, okay, let's do that. I didn't feel like leaving. I had a lot of friends over there. Um, so I ended up doing uh, an MBA. Now, during this time, um, I'm going to get into what made me get into dentistry. But um, during this time, I was still shadowing, like I said before. I was shadowing all the medical professions. I was still interested in it. I just didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. And it was actually... Um, one trip, one summer, I should say, where I told myself it was after my sophomore year of college. Um, and I told myself, you know what, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do this summer. I'm going to see if I want to go into business or if I want to do something else medical related. So I remember that summer I had an eight week ex uh, internship at Morgan Stanley in New York City um, in Midtown. Um, I did that and I was hoping that I would like it and I absolutely hated it. It just wasn't for me. But luckily I had other programs lined up, like my trip to the Galapagos Islands, um, which was happened to be a dental mission trip. So um, I went on that trip and I loved it. So being in that summer, it was cool to kind of see that I loved something so much and hated something so much. 
So I knew which path I wanted to go down. Now, that was after my sophomore year. So as you can see, I did continue my degrees. I did get an MBA. But that was mostly because I realized through shadowing and talking to people and seeing what people have been doing that a business degree is really important or, or a business knowledge is really important for dentistry um, because you're going to be out there in your own practice. And just like any business, your practice could lose money and then you can't do your job. So everyone I spoke to said it's really important to know business, whatever you do. So I was already in the position to get a degree. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep it. So um, I ended up uh, applying to nine schools. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 schools. I ended up getting into uh, nine of them. Um, uh, interviews to nine of them. And then I got into, into six schools after that. So the interviews started coming in. Um, I'm not showing this to, to kind of boast about it. I'm showing this because what I'm trying to explain is like everything that I've done and all these milestones that I became really excited about, it's all just a result of hard work and talking to people and being in the right, right spot at the right time. Um, you know, when the interviews came in again, like, was it lucky? I like, in my opinion, no, because everything was planned. I knew exactly what I was doing. And when I was doing it, when I was taking a class and studying for a test, I was not studying to just pass the class. I was studying to get an A in the class. Um, there's a difference between the two, right? Prerequisites in your classes, uh, prerequisites for dental school. I don't like that term because you're required to take it before you go to dental school. But there are plenty of people that take these classes that don't get to dental school, and that's because of uh, grades, right? So even though in college, you might be able to use that course as a prereq to get to the next course, that grade might not be sufficient for, for dental school. So I went in knowing that every, every science class that I took, I was going to try to do the best I can. So I ultimately obviously chose uh, Stony Brook. So that's where I went for my, my dental school education. So I was there for four years um, and, you know, every, every kind of moment in my life, um, you feel like there's something else beyond it, right? So the, the best analogy I can give you is like, imagine you were, you were like in fifth grade and you think, you know, I'm the, I'm the top of the grade, like I'm the top of the class, right? You're the big guy in the school. But then you go to middle school and then you realize, wow, I'm actually like the small person. Like, I don't really know many people. I don't know many. I don't I don't know anyone. Um, you know, I, 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 I feel like I'm small. And then you get to eighth grade and you're like, oh, I'm the big guy again in school. Like, I know everything. And then you get to and then you got to high school. Right. And so on and so forth. So I felt like in college, like I was I was at the top. Right. And then you get to dental school and you realize you're really not at the top. You're at the bottom. So. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because at any moment in your life, you're going to feel like you're not at the very best. And there's a lot of times where you will feel like you're at the very, at your very best. So it's important to be humble and understand where you're at in your process and don't compare yourself to others because it's very easy to get lost in the process. Um, so again, white coat ceremony, like an amazing time, but I didn't foresee that. Okay. I'm like, about to start seeing patients, right? A whole new responsibility. And then you see patients and you realize how hard it is to talk to patients. Um, and then, you know, as a D3, this is when we started basically going to clinic every day. I thought, again, I was at the top, right? And then as a fourth year, you realize how much you really don't know and how much you really need to learn. So, um, you know, then you're kind of at the bottom and then you finish your fourth year and then you're at the top again. So, um, you know, it, it's always important to just to stay humble during every every part of your process um, and be grateful for where you're at. Um, so I did a little research at, at Stony Brook. I traveled to San Diego. I presented at the Academy of Osseo Integration. Again, a conference that I was invited to attend. I was I had a research opportunity. I did absolutely no research in undergrad, negative research. I just wasn't something that interested me. Um, and then when I got to Stony Brook, I was approached by one of my faculty. He's like, I think you would do great with this topic. It's on implants. 
So I said, okay, like, let's see, I'll, I'll try it. I ended up doing an entire research project and presenting at San Diego, in San Diego at the Academy of Osseo Integration. Fast forward, because um, Crystal, you kind of already um, explained how I'm an implant fellow. I'm placing implants all the time now and I'm working. So all of this stuff kind of comes full circle, right? And it comes back to my original idea, which is, you know, take any opportunity that you're given because the worst that happens is you could not like it and you stop it. So I took an opportunity to do research in implants. I realized I liked it and now I'm doing an implant fellowship program. All right. And then finally graduated and it's amazing. And then, you know, now I'm in GPR and you realize, you know, when you join GPR, you realize, okay, I'm, I'm really at the bottom again, right? Like you're learning way, like more new things. Um, so it's a fun roller coaster to be on. <clears throat> okay. So this is me in, in general practice residency. I was um, molding a plate for a orbital floor fracture, which I never thought I would do in the operating room. And then now I am a chief resident and this is me the other day doing a, a lateral sinus window. So a sinus lift, which I never thought I would do. So a lot of these experiences, like I'm, I'm going, I keep on going back to the idea of being, you know, um, humble because I've never done one of those, but you asked me to prepare for a crown or do fillings like those stuff to me are easy, but you're always a student in dentistry right? Like you, there's always more to learn. Um, there's better ways to do things and you're a student of the game. So I want to, now I went through kind of my process. I want to get into um, how I got there because I think that's the most important thing. I told you from the surface level, like, yes, I got into six schools, got nine interviews and, um, you know, had and basically got uh, and, and applied to 10 schools. So surface level, it seems like, oh, wow, like he, I could probably do that. But I want to show you exactly how I got there. Because I think that's, that's an important thing um, to kind of uh, understand and see what work went into it. All right. So like everyone, a um, lot, lots and lots of studying, right? So I don't know if anyone did things like this, right? And whiteboards have, like, killed so many trees with your notes, like, how many of you probably look like this, right? So like you all did a lot of studying, so doing well in your classes is important. Um, I was a, an RA. So this was, this was interesting. And this is something that um, looking back on it, I'm really happy I did because at this point, this was my sophomore year. Um, you know, everyone's graduating with debt from college, right? College is really expensive now, especially dental school. This was a way for me to save money. It's all, it was also a really good way to get good experience overseeing a group of residents, um, of, of uh, students. So um, I had this position. It taught me a lot just about responsibility. Um, and that's something I really use in my application, being um, more responsible um, and more mature. So some hand skill programs. Um, you know, you guys probably do this all the time. Um, just getting your hands wet whenever you can. So this was the Galapagos mission trip I went on, which was which was amazing. We packed in these um, bags. Uh, those were our supplies and equipment. We set up in the only hospital on the island, in Island Isabella. <clears throat> this was our hostel. It was unreal, like the bluest water you'll ever see, ever. And this was me assisting. I've never assisted before. I told you at the beginning, this was kind of what sparked my interest in dentistry. Um, so I had no experience. I barely had any shadowing at this point. And they just threw me in it. And I loved every second of it. I was like one of the last ones to stay every single day. Um, so what I'm trying to gather from, from all, what I'm trying to kind of stimulate you guys from all of this is any opportunity you're given, just take, because you don't know if you're going to like it. Okay. So over there, we also had fun, blue-footed booby. We went out with the residents um, at, with the dental students because this was through Yukon Dental School. We went out to um, an ice cream shop. So this is something that actually I used on applications to this day, something I talked about in my dental school application. Um, <clears throat> we were treating um, a bunch of patients. We probably treated like over 200 patients in the few days that we were there. Um, and 
one of the kids, he was about eight years old, he had carries on all the teeth. So we did some rest of on him, some extractions um, during the couple of days we were there. Um, we were we would walk by this this in the town. It was like all dirt roads. I wish I had more pictures of the dirt roads, but um, they were all dirt roads. And we would walk in the town and a lot of the restaurants were always open. This one ice cream shop was closed basically all the time. The last day that we were there, it was open. So we were like, let's go get some ice cream. It was a family. Um, it was a family who was coming to our clinic and the child was receiving care and they gave us all free ice cream. And they were like, thank you for what you did. Like, it was like, you don't understand. He was in pain for like, like the last year, basically. Um, because there's really no dentist on the island. So um, this is something that I carried on my dental school application into my residency application. This is the reason why I went into this profession is because of, a, of an experience like that. Um, so that is my why of why I'm doing this. And also guys, feel free if you want, you can interrupt me at any point. I know we're gonna do questions at the end, but if something is pressing, you can interrupt me. So like with everyone, did the pre-dental society, um, did some soap carving. Um, I had some leadership positions there. We went to local elementary schools to teach children about oral hygiene. That was also an amazing thing because they're innocent children who want to just learn. So it was fun. Um, did a pre-dental week at Stony Brook. So I actually did this as a pre-dental student. That's me on the right. And then as a dental student, I was a mentor. So I had a mentee over here and then I was the mentor over here. So that was a really cool experience. Um, just seeing it come full circles, giving back, right? Don't forget from where you've been. I always give this analogy, you know, I golf a lot. Um, I'm not great, I'm fine, but um, I've gotten a lot better over the last five years. Um, so whenever I go on a course and I see someone really struggling, there's a lot of people out there that will yell at them and curse at them and say, you're holding everyone up. But I was there at one point, like I was a bad golfer one time. So I always try to remember that I was in their shoes at one point. Um, so just remember that moving, moving forward. Okay. I also did have fun. Um, I want you guys to know that I wasn't someone who just like studied all the time and did pre-dental stuff. Um, this was for my Case Western interview. I went the night before. Um, sorry if you heard the story before you follow me, but um, <clears throat> I went the night before um, to stay in the hotel. My interview was next morning. Um, I had a friend who said, you know, the Yankees, I'm not even a Yankees fan, but they're like, you know, the Yankees are playing at the Cleveland Indian Stadium, um, who are now the Cleveland Guardians, but uh, do you want to go? Like, I know you're going to Cleveland. Like, I'll come with you. Let's go. And at first I was like, you know what? Like I might interview the next morning. Like I want to just relax, prepare for it. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's just go to the game and like enjoy it. So I ended up going to the game. We ended up getting on TV. The next morning I go to my interview and I sit down. Actually, before I sit down, my interviewer shakes my hand. And he's like, hey, so how's your time in Cleveland? I see you're from New York. I was like, it's great. Went to the Yankee game last night. So it was cool to see them being from New York. And he's like, I was there too. Turns out we talked about that the entire the entire interview. He was sitting two rows, two sections over from me. We saw the same person get thrown out. We saw the same game. He happened to be from the Bronx, big Yankee fan. I was not a Yankee fan, so I told him that. So it was it was funny. But um, always you know, try to be. It's not all about studying. It's all all about school, right? Like dentistry is different from medicine in a lot of ways. One being that. You know, we have really unique conversations and build unique relationships with patients. So, you know, people don't like robots. So try to try to, you know, keep that in mind as well. Um, this was another interview. I play soccer. So um, we were in the finals um, of, a, of a match. I lived in a house with a bunch of kids. Um, I knew the minute I got home, there was no studying. So I would stay in the library late. Um, some more friends, some of my really good friends. Um, so in dental school, um, I talk a lot about like being involved in clubs and organizations and, you know, um, being fun, that type of stuff. Um, in dental school, it's no different, right? Like you want to get into residency so um, you can do different things. You be a part of different organizations. I talked about continuously learning. Um, so with my business background, we started a basically a business club um, at dental, in dental school. So we did a bunch of different events. 
when it's a lobby day, I'm not going to bore you with this. Azure District 2 meeting. I continued soccer. So we, we had a soccer team. I also played volleyball and I did a bunch of continuing education, whether it's like pho photography classes or <clears throat> digital smile design, if you know Chris Coachman. All right. And then again, I did research, which I showed you that before. But the most important thing is mentorship, right? People who have done it before you can show you the ropes. That's the important thing. So um, these are a bunch of my mentors that I luckily had um, over the last um, four years of dental school and into residency. All right. So I'm going to go into the day in the life of a chief resident. Um, so <clears throat> in many states, I don't know where everyone's from, but I'm from New York. New York is one of the only two states in America that you need to do a general practice residency or an AGD or some sort of residency in order to practice. So it's very easy if you live in any other state to just get out of dental school and start practicing. So when I was in dental school, I, I was a little bummed out that I needed to do a residency. I was like, I want to just get out and start working, but I couldn't be more happy to do a residency. And if you are a fan of dental nachos, they are, everyone's from all over the country and they are very um, keen in doing residencies as well. And I'll give you reasons why. The first reason is that you're going to see things that you've never seen before. And you don't want to see it for the first time on a patient that you're treating that's paying you directly. Um, second thing is mentorship, right? So you're going to be working with doctors one-on-one -on -one that are there specifically to help you. They're not there to make money. They're not there to see their own patients. They're there to make sure that you expand your dental education um, by doing it every day. If you, to, if you were to work in a private practice, <clears throat> a private practice has multiple docs in it. If, you, if the owner doc that hires you, hires you, they want you to do the job. They don't want to sit next to you and hold your hand while you're doing the job. So a lot of the times, if you go straight into private practice, you're doing either a lot of continue, continuing education or your first year is basically like a residency where you're learning a lot. However, that's on patients that is, are your patients in your practice. So your reputation starts immediately after you graduate dental school. So if you're messing up on a patient, um, let's say you're doing some crown and bridge and you're not getting good margins, you have to redo the crown three times, patients don't like when you have to redo a crown three times. Um, but let's say you're in a residency and you take that first impression and the doctor says, you know what, I think you can do a little better. You take a new one, you put it in the first time. There are different ways to go about it. There's a hundred different ways to learn. You have to realize what kind of works with you. All right, <clears throat> so I kind of just went into that. So in my residency, I'm just gonna show you a couple, a couple cases that I did that um, I don't think I would have been able to do in private practice alone. I'm not going to lie. I think that they were pretty far beyond my scope of practice. But then again, I was able to work with prosthodontists. I was able to work. I'm going to go through it. Endodontists. Um, I was able to work with implantologists. I was able to work with oral surgeons, right? You work with all these people to be able to develop your own repertoire of uh, education. So this patient came to me um, and she looked like this. Um, this is actually a little after, but she had a bunch of grossly carious teeth. We took out a couple, two of the front teeth. She was missing two already and she wants teeth. She's 87 years old. These are, uh, previous crowns. These, I wish I had occlusal shots They're The nerve is basically exposed. All right. So I end up, um, taking off those four crowns. So you can see they're old PFM crowns, um, took them off. I re-prepared them, got rid of all the caries. <clears throat> did the root canals on both of these did not need post because it was a lot of tooth structure. She had, I wish I put the x-rays in here, but she had very high pulp horns, meaning that the nerve came up very high through the tooth. You can actually, if you, if you take a look over here, if you see that little dot right there, that's her nerve. So she's older, but she has really, her nerve is really high. So these two needed root canals did those. Um, and then in the same day, I prepared the, these for a bridge I prepared this for a bridge and I gave her temporaries. And um, what I used for this is a, a lab fabricated temporary, meaning that the lab makes a temporary. So what they'll do is before I do touch the patient at all, 
they're going to send me uh, something called the PMMA temporary, which is uh, a very strong acrylic temporary. Um, and they will grossly, um, I guess they'll guess where the preparation will be. So I usually tell them about one millimeter takeoff just so I have a shell. Um, so they did that for the top and the bottom. And so after three and a half hours, this is what she looked like leaving. Um, I didn't finish relining the bottom. I have other pictures, but um, this is what she looks like after um, three hours. I don't think I would be able to do this if it wasn't for residency. I really don't. I think that this in three hours, I got a lot of guidance, luckily. Um, but this is something that's really great. So this hack actually was like the third or fourth case that I'm doing similar to this. So at this point, I really knew what to do. Um, I, I was communicating with the lab. I had little help with this, but for your first or second one that you do, you really need to be, you, you need your hand to be held because they're really complicated stuff. All right. So this is what she looked like after leaving my office and her, and she loved it, loved it. I mean, what she had before versus this, everything is uniform. She has lower teeth. So what we're going to plan on doing just so that everyone's aware, um, we're gonna be making her a partial denture for the back. So the first thing I had to increase her bite because um, what she came, she looked like this, she wasn't biting down, but you can see all the wear on the front of the teeth. So she was overclosed. So what I did was I opened her up um, and then ultimately gave her her temporary so she can just be comfortable in them, try them out. And then once we're ready to go to final, we're gonna, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the final impression of all the teeth. I'm going to send out, going to put the bridge in and then make her a denture on the back so that she has posterior support. In dentistry, it's really important to have posterior support. Um, think of um, think of what happens when you're closing down, right? Like a nutcracker, right? Most pressure is in the back. So imagine you have nothing in the back. You're going to be you're you're going to be clenching down in the front. And then that's probably why she had those wear facets in the front because she kept on just grinding down her teeth. All right, next case. Um, this patient came to me actually in a temporary. <clears throat> this was the temporary that he came in and he wanted teeth. Temporary is not great, but it was based off of what he had in the past. He's wearing a denture on the bottom. The bottom's eventually gonna be an overdenture. So we're gonna put two implants on the bottom, um, probably in the, the lateral incisor positions right here, potentially in the canine positions, just to, just to hold it in. Um, it's good if you can get four in there, if you can afford it. And this is the final that he had. This is a porcelain bridge in the front. So he had about six teeth here, a lot of rotated teeth, a lot of bad dentistry. And this is how he left. I don't know if I would be able to do this if I didn't do a general practice residency. This is something that makes me excited. All right. So I mentioned to you earlier about root canals as well. So <clears throat> root canals are something you do in dental school, but not nearly enough for whatever reason. So endodontists do a lot of complicated root canals. That's what they're known for. You go to their office, they can do a root canal probably in 45 minutes. So Every Wednesday, a root, uh, an, an endodontist, a root canal specialist comes in to specifically work with us. They sit with you and they're there to teach you. So these are some of the root canals that I did. I did lower molar, I did upper molar, um, another lower mo molar. This one has four canals. You can see this one has only two. So there's a lot of different anatomy, which you learn. Um, and then this was a couple, I just did the number uh, six over here, but these were, were also done. So I'm going to show you a really, a really cool case because I'm coming back to this idea of you're always going to be learning, right? You don't, dentistry sometimes is really isolating, especially if you're in your own office and you're by yourself. So it's good to communicate with other uh, specialists. So this was a really difficult case I did. <clears throat> so I was doing tooth number 29, uh, 28 and 27. So as you can see here, so I used my files. I got down to the to the working length down here, right? But then when I, I, I felt like I was done, 
right? I got all the way down. I felt like I was done. I was ready to, uh, I put my gut approach and I took an x-ray. And then at a different angle of the x-ray, you don't see it here. Do you see that little, that darkening right there, everyone? So I looked at that x-ray and I'm like, is that another canal? So in this x-ray, you don't see anything. In this x-ray, you do. That's the same tooth. So I realized, okay, I think there's another canal. So it was one canal that went down that split into two. So with premolars on the bottom, there's a lot of different anatomy. You can have like a single canal that splits into two that comes back into one. You can have two canals that come into one. You can have, in this case, one canal that splits into two. So I didn't know what to do with this. So the endodontist was like, take a scan of it, a CBCT. I hope if everyone, if no one knows what a CBCT is, it takes basically a bone scan um, in different views. So it basically cuts um, the skull in a bunch of, basically a bunch of segments. So we had a coronal view of the CBCT. So this is a video. So you can see these are the two root canals that I started. So I was, I was ready to finish. So this is number 27. So this is a canine. This is number 28. This is the, uh, the premolar. So you can see as, so imagine you're looking down at the tooth and we're going straight down to the apex of the tooth, down to the bottom of the root. So there's a bunch of different slices that we're looking at. So as it's going down, think we're going through like a, in a water park, right? You're going through um, a slide, right? And you see like all like the different connections of the slide, you're going through the slide, right? So you're going from one end of the slide to the other, about halfway down the root, do you see right there, it's split into two. So I'm gonna play that again. You see right here, it's one, right here, we're looking at this one, it's one, and then it splits into two, right? So, and then you can see it go, comes out the, the bottom. So what that showed us is that it was a single canal that went into two, right? This is after I filled it, what it looked like, okay? so. So we took a, a CVCT before I filled and one after I filled just for learning experiences and also to make sure that we are, we're in the right areas. So the endodontist goes to me, you know, what you need to do is you need to take all the sealer that you can. When you put gutta percha in a canal, you add sealer to it. Um, it's kind of like cement. So the gutta percha stays. So I put a lot of gutta percha and just pump it in there so that the sealer, because she was like, you're never going to get down the other canal. It's impossible right? I can't even do it. So take a lot of sealer, pump it in there, and hopefully it flows into that canal. And she said, because you irrigated it so much, you should be okay. You should have cleaned all the bacteria. So I said, okay. So if you can see the same thing here, do you see it splits? I'm sorry. It's, it's a little hard to see, but okay. Do you see it splits right here? I know it's hard to see. So I got the sealer into this one right here and one right here. So I got that sealer into the canal. So it was all sealed. I wouldn't have been able to do that alone. Okay. And then this was a final x-ray of that, right? So I got down both canals with the gutta percha and the sealer. And this was my other root canal that I did. So without general practice residency, it's really difficult to do these cases. You would refer this out to the end of the honest. I'm not saying I won't in private practice, but it's what you feel comfortable with. And it's it's being able, being able to diagnose certain conditions. So if you don't know and you've never done it, you won't know what to look for. So in this case, if I didn't, if I wasn't like so curious and I didn't see that, I would have filled the one canal. She probably in a couple of months from now would have pain down there. Right. And then she would come back. I would be like, the root canal, look, the root canal looks perfect down here. What's wrong with it? There's really another canal that's going down. I would not be able to do that in private practice. So I'm going to get into the implant stuff um, because um, I'm in an implant program. So we do a lot of uh, full arch restorative. So it's important with implant planning. Um, it's restoratively driven. So implant surgery obviously is a surgery you put implants in bone, but those implants need to be in the correct orientation and location in order for it to be successful. 
So if you're going to get anything out of this presentation, it is that in order for implants to be successful, it needs to be restoratively driven. Okay. So this is how this patient presents it to me. She has a lower denture, um, which I made her actually. And then we were, we want to work on her top. These, all these teeth, you can see they're, they're not in good shape. Um, a lot of bone loss, there's cavities right around the root surfaces of almost all of them. So our first goal was one, this, her, she was a little canted um, to one side. So our goal was to create a, a perfect smile for her based on what she had. So actually we took off these crowns um, and um, I prepared the teeth for just strictly so we can see how we want her to look because we're restoratively driven. We wanna make sure the final is perfect. So when we put the implants in, we can make her something. So this is how we kind of made it. These teeth are a little long in my opinion, but this is pretty good considering what she had before. She went from this and this is just a temporary. You, wherever you go, I've mentioned this multiple times, whatever you do, wherever you go, always have a mentor that can show you the ropes. <laughs> Because someone else. I um, You want a So someone else somewhere has done it before. Um, so it's important to have a mentor at whatever stage. I have mentors now that are doctors that are showing me the ropes, right? When I was out in um, a, a pre dental student, I had a mentor that got into dental school that helped me. When I was in dental school, we had buddies like our our bigs right we had bigs the same way in sororities and fraternities you have bigs and littles do you have bigs and littles in dental school that show you the ropes it's important to have a mentor wherever you go all right and then this is an implant i placed today actually um so you want to be parallel with the adjacent teeth you want it to come out of the occlusal surface of the tooth so when you plan this you actually want, I, I wish i had the software on here but um, you actually put a fake tooth here and you make sure that the implant orientation is, is perfect so that you can place it. So I actually did this freehand. So I didn't use a guide or anything, but we do a lot of guided surgery. Okay. And um, I'm just going to explain kind of where you might say like, oh, what's the pre-dental consultants? So um, I mentor students to get into dental school. Um, we have a bunch of coaches that are, that help students from all over the country. Um, so it's a really exciting thing to watch students be successful getting in. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, get into many schools. Um, I was fortunate enough to have the best mentors possible. Um, and when COVID hit, I wanted to give back to students because there's a lot of people who don't have mentors. There's a lot of people who are struggling getting into school. Um, and luckily I've been blessed to be able to provide those services to people. Um, so um, I want many to experience the same success that I did, um, to follow a similar path that I did. I don't only teach students how to get into de to dental school, I teach them how to be amazing doctors and good learners. Because being in this profession, you have to be able to be a good communicator, a good learner, um, and open to learn and, and, and willing to learn new things. Um, you know, when you get into dental school, you're going to eventually have to get into specialty programs. Grades are important. It's good to learn new study strategies, new tactics. Um, when I was, I remember, um, this is a little, another story. When I was in, um, fifth grade, I was like doing great. I, all my teachers liked me. And then sixth grade hit, I remember I, I got pulled aside in the middle of the year and they were like, What's going on? You were in honors in fifth grade. Why are you not doing well this year? And I remember just not taking it seriously. I remember being in sixth grade and like, I would go, I had new friends. I was going after school to play with my friends. I was going to the gym, like to play basketball, that type of stuff. The exact same thing happened in ninth grade. I, I picked it up by eighth grade, doing well, did well in the regents exams, all like the, the exams that you need to take, did well in them. And then Ninth grade hit and the exact same thing happened. Made new friends, just didn't care about school. So when I was a freshman in college, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to make that same mistake. I already had two conversations, sixth grade and ninth grade. When I get into um, undergrad, I'm not going to have that issue. So I really buckled down and I made sure grades were important. I made sure I knew how to study 
I made sure that I was doing well in my classes. I was putting all of that first. Um, and I still did have a social life as you got that. And then I did the same exact thing my freshman, my first year of dental school. Did the same thing in GPR. It's important to start off strong. It's more important to end off stronger. Um, so I have just information about the about the program here. These are some of the schools that we we have um, coaches at. Um, we've gotten over 100 students into different dental schools. My goal is to have a dental student at every single school in the country so that all, our students can reach out to them and have kind of like an inside scoop into the programs. We have um, our website with just stuff. If you're interested, you can contact me. Um, and then this is kind of teaching how to get into dental school. This is um, a program, a tracker software that is coming out hopefully very shortly um, within the next month. Um, and it's basically, you can track your GPAs, courses, experiences, that, that type of stuff. So when you get to the application, it's basically pretty seamless. Like you don't have to, you can basically copy and paste it. Um, the experience section, it's, it's basically identical to what you see on the application. Um, and we also, you know, we, we do these sessions similar to how I'm doing this one. We do our own um, occasionally, which is fun. And then, um, so it's really important. It's really expensive to apply to dental school. So just make sure you budget for it. Um, a lot of people don't really get that applying to dental school is expensive. So uh, I didn't really understand it. That's why I'm saying it because um, the application, they say the application's 295 for the first one an extra 95 each additional application you send through, but then they don't tell you about every school wants their fair cut. So every school sends you an email saying, you actually have to pay an extra $300 to us for your application. So if you apply to 20 schools, you can do the math about how much money that is. So definitely budget for that. Um, it's expensive if you take a gap year because that's a year of income that you're not generating. It's expensive if you have to reapply. So just make note of that. I always tell my students, it's important to apply once and apply really strong and make sure you do really well. Don't take anything lightly. This is a really important thing. Um, when you get the interview, the interview is what will get you into the school. Um, the application will get you an interview, but they need to like you in the interview in order for you to get a spot. Um, so don't take the interview lightly. Just like I said before, I gave you a little snippet of like one of my interviews, be a person, don't be a robot be um, amicable, be friendly, you know, just be yourself. All right. Okay, this is just kind of some of that. Did some quick math on that. So you, you can look at, you know, I applied to, so average number of dental schools applied to, you can be spending, you know, $5,000 on applications. It's, it's, it's really expensive. So make sure you budget for that. And then if you, if you were interested in possibly joining, you know, just message me. Um, I have my email. You can schedule a time to speak on the phone. I love speaking to students. Um, if I can give you any tips on where you're at right now, that would be, that'd be awesome. I, I like doing that. Um, they're just quick calls. So if you wanted to do that, you can. And then there's our website and then some contact information. So I, perfect, right on the money, 45 minutes. So I'm gonna leave it now open to some questions. I know we had some in the chat, um, but I hope that that was helpful. I showed you a little bit of my journey, um, what a GPR is, um, why it's important to do a residency, in my opinion, um, and you know how to be a successful applicant in the process because that's you're all probably gonna go through that very soon. All right. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Greenberg for a very informative session. I'm pretty sure a lot of people found this really helpful. Um, we're just going to walk into, uh, go into the Q&A. Um, so we had some questions come in the chat. So uh, the first one was, what were some of your weaknesses that you had in dental school and how did you improve them? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I felt like one of my weaknesses uh, in dental school, let's say, um, I would say it was it was lab work. Like I felt like at at first it was taking me a long time to do lab work. Um, but like with everything, like if you spend 10 hours in the lab, you'll get good at it, right? <laughs> so um, with with a lot of things that you feel like you're bad at, a little a little effort goes a very long way. So if you put in a little effort into trying to focus on those like weaknesses, um, 
you'll slowly get better. You don't have to spend 10 hours in a lab, but over the course of a year, if you do a little every day to get better at something that you're not good at, then you'll get a little better at it. Now, the same goes with like the DAT, right? They always say, if you're really good at, you know, cube counting, don't do cube counting all the time. You don't want to do something that you're really good at all the time. You want to focus on the things that you're weak at so that you can hopefully be good at all of it. But you can't neglect the stuff that you're good at because um, sometimes, you know, in dental school, we didn't do a lot of root canals. So I felt like coming out of dental school, I, this is another thing. I felt like I was really weak at root canals. Like I felt like I didn't know it that well. So when I came into residency, I felt like I was behind the ball with it. Um, but I made sure to get the cases. I made sure to ask questions and learn. And I feel very confident with root canals now um, in, in doing that. So that was a very good question. Uh, the next question is, did you pick your residency location or were you placed somewhere by your dental school in New York? If you picked your residency location, then why did you pick that location over the others? So uh, when you apply to residency, you can, you go through something called the match. I know this is getting a little over your heads, but um, basically you interview at different schools. So you apply the same way you apply to dental school. You get interviews the same way they get interviews in dental school. You go to the interviews the same way you go to interviews in dental school. But then the difference is, is that you don't get accepted to all the programs. Like in dental school, you can get accepted to 10 schools. Here, what you do is you you rank your rank the programs that you like the most. So you rank your you rank the programs, and then the programs rank you, and then some algorithm matches you into a program. So I picked the residency programs I applied to. I also picked <clears throat> I also picked the um, programs I ranked. So I only ranked programs and applied to programs in the location I wanted to be. So technically, no, I did not choose. Um, the the program that I'm in or the location it happened to be one of my first choices and I was accepted into it so technically I did choose it because I wanted to go there but if I didn't get into that program I could be anywhere um, in New York but I only got into New York programs because that was the only programs I applied to you can't like if I applied to an Arizona program I could technically go to Arizona if I put that first Thank you. Um, the next question is, what things uh, besides financing did you take into consideration when looking for dental schools and finally deciding? Um, I looked in, one of the biggest things was location. Like I wanted to be close to home. That was something I knew dental school was going to be difficult. I knew that it was going to be a long four years, which happened to be a very short four years, but that's a different story. Um, but I wanted to be close to home. I wanted to be close to my friends. Um, you, I said this multiple times, you need to have fun. So like you can't be studying every waking moment of the day. You have to make sure to spend time with your dental school friends, but also have friends on the outside that you can get your mind off of teeth. So um, location was a big factor for me. The other big factor for me was um, clinical experience. Um, I came out, I felt like I came out very um, confident in my clinical abilities but then on the other hand, I realized how little that really matters because um, you the amount I learned in residency trumps everything that I learned in dental school. So um, I would go to a program that is close to home that doesn't break the bank, right? You're going to spend a lot of money anyway. Might as well spend a little less money and go to a, maybe a, a public school. Um, and then the last thing is... Um, um, making sure that you get something that has good clinical experience, or if you are interested in a specialty, good specialty experience. Um, the next question is, how do you balance work, social life, and family life? Uh, that's a good question. Um, when you get home, leave work at work. And, and then when, you, when you're at home, try not to think about it. It's very easy to think about the cases. Um, but what I try to do is I try to plan things in advance. So this happened like two weeks ago where um, I had, uh, I was planning on meeting up with a bunch of friends at night at like eight o'clock. Um, so I remember that day being really difficult for me. Like I felt like the day would, it was one of those days where I felt like it just wasn't going to end. And I went home and I was thinking to myself on any ordinary day, I probably would just like, sit on the couch and watch TV. 
right? And like avoid my friends. I like don't feel like socializing, that type of stuff. But that day, because I had a plan already, I felt obligated to go. And when I went, I felt like my mind was completely off dentistry. My day, the the bad day that I had completely went away. So something that I've been trying to do since then is plan things. So for instance, I went to the US Open last night, right? Again, probably a long day of dentistry, but then it's fun to look forward to something to do. So if you plan things in advance and you don't do things day of, like if I said, if I came home and I'm like, everyone's going to US Open, should I go? It's very easy for me to say no. But if I already had tickets, I'm like, All right, I have to go. And then you go and you realize how fun it is and that you're getting your mind off stuff. Um, in terms of family life, I, I always try to see my family. I, I see my brother all the time and my parents. I, I try to see them at least once or twice a week, either for dinner or FaceTime or that. And I talk to my mom every morning on the way to work. So um, it's you know a combination of things. Also, if you're really interested in dentistry and you want to take it to the next level, start listening to dental podcasts. I have a podcast, which is really awesome. Um, but I listen to something called Chair Practices, Dentrepreneur. There's a lot of good podcasts you can listen to. It's just, there's like the, the pre-dental podcast I used to listen to as a pre-dental student. So there's some good podcasts. Um, it gets you motivated. It makes you want to go through this. Um, so I, I would recommend doing that. Uh, the next question is, um, what is some advice you have if you decide to take a gap year? Like how do you utilize your time? Yeah, that's a good question too. So um, with a gap year, I, I personally love gap years. Um, only if it's a planned gap year. Like if you want to do it for a specific reason, like if you need, if you've decided on dentistry late and you want to try to get more experience um, or if you want to increase your grades, those are great. Uh, a poor gap year, I would say, is one where you apply to dental school and you apply too late and you just don't get in because then you're, you're not planning your gap year. It's kind of just, you're taking a gap year um, because you're forced to. Um, so during a gap year, it's important to get dental experience. So either shadowing, I, I would say working, if you can assist at a practice, a lot of states, you don't need to be a, a registered uh, assistant or a certified assistant. Um, but if you can become one, that would be great. Um, so Assisting experience. The next thing um, is just focusing on uh, leadership. So doing a lot of community service and being active in the community. I would say a poor use of a gap year is strictly just studying for the DAT. Because of course it's important, but they want to see that you're doing things. So if you're going to study for the, study for the DAT over the course of the year, make sure you're getting some shadowing in, make sure you're getting some assisting in, Make sure you're involved in different organizations, maybe dental organizations. Going on a mission trip would be amazing during that time. Like you have the time to do it. I would recommend anyone, if you have the funds and the time, go on a mission trip. It will change your life. Um, and you can, like me, use it with every single application that you go through. So a lot of the students that I work with, a decent amount of them, I've, I've encouraged them to go on mission trips and they have. And it is like, I mean, a no brainer when it comes to admissions because they love students who do that. So if you can, I would recommend doing that during a gap year. Uh, the next question is what motivates you to come in and work on patients every day? Good question. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's the way that it makes them feel after like one the dentistry is great and you can make them feel great. But two, I, I generally like talking and speaking to my patients. Like I, I feel like I have a lot in common with them um, or I try to at least like be on, get, get on good relationship with them. So it's like seeing a friend every day, right? Like when you see a friend, you like get excited to see them, right? Like it's nice to have a patient that comes in that you're excited to see, right? And then when you do the dentistry that can make them happier and improve their life, it makes it better. So that's what kind of motivates me. The other motivating factor for me is just being in this environment. I, I love just like the dental community. Like I know treating patients is one thing, but like I go to a lot of events. Um, I have my mentorship program. I like being in the dental environment. That's what, that's what I like doing. Like, I feel like we have a lot in common. 
Um, so just being in the environment of like-minded people is something that motivates me as well. Um, the next question is, where can you find mission trip opportunities? Yeah, so there's there's a bunch of um, uh, opportunities if you look online. Um, so like medical brigades is one of them. Um, that's a, a one that a lot of students go on or international brigades. Um, <clears throat> there's if you look on there's like national organizations that go on these mission trips. Um, so you can just kind of see if you just search mission trip dentistry, like a bunch of organizations come up. Um, let me see if I can do, I, I can probably just do a, a quick search. Mission trips dentistry. Yeah. So this is volunteer world came up. All right. Yeah. International medical relief comes up. Um, so global dental relief comes up. So the one that I've seen students do is, is the dental brigades. So this one's a lot of students will do. So dental volunteer abroad. So you can, can you see my screen? All right, awesome. So yeah, so you can like apply through here. That's what brigades. So if you have the time, it's it's really, really amazing. So I've, I've had students, I went on the Panama trip, so. Uh, we have time for two more questions. So uh, the next one is, how would you best advise asking for a letter of recommendation if your college was shifted online because of COVID? Um, so we have email templates that we give to our students, but the best way is to give your resume, your personal statement, send an email asking um, if they would be willing to write it and also recount an experience from their class. So let's say you started out with 80s on the test and you ended up with like 90s and higher. Like you should say like, I feel like your class allowed me to improve. I improved my study habits. I went from an, a B minus to an A, to an a um, over the course of the year. And I felt like a lot of my improvements came from your class. Um, <clears throat> if you were a TA for a class that you want a letter of recommendation, say I TA during this, during this time, um, I helped do the questions. A lot of like these bigger science teachers, like they have so many students, they don't remember you. So as much as you want them to, but like they, they really don't, it's really hard for them to. So just as much information as you can give them about yourself and, and what your relationship with that person is would be great. Send an email. Um, if an email doesn't work, the other option is like to go visit them in their office, but usually they're pretty good with emails. So just ask them, don't tell them. So say, would you mind writing me a letter of recommendation? I need it by the state. Please let me know if that's possible. Here's my resume, you know, and then you can kind of give like the little tidbit of like what you did. Uh, we have one last question. Um, what mm -hmm. type of advice would you give to someone that has a low science GPA? Um. <clears throat> Depends how low. So I've worked with students. I've gotten students in with like a three one three two GPA, um, because I my belief is that a lot of a lot of what <clears throat> um, gets you into dental school happen has to do with your application and your personal statement and getting them to fall in love with you. However, if you have a low like below a three zero science GPA, really the only way is to do some sort of uh, post back program. Um, that's really one of the only ways to go about it. Um, retaking classes, it's really hard once you have lower grades to get it up really quickly. So um, I'm going through this with one of my students now who has a 2.9 GPA and they want to get it up to a 3.2. Um, <clears throat> and in order for her to do that, it she needs to get like an A in 20 plus credits which is a lot of credits. That's like basically getting a 4.0 in a semester, a little over a semester, uh, like a semester and a half, which is not an easy thing to do. So um, typically I would recommend at that point to do a post back program because it, you can basically wipe out your old GPA and get a whole new GPA, which is really nice. On the application, it will be one GPA. So your undergrad and your grad school GPA will come together. However, when you send your transcript, they can see the differences. Um, so they can see the improvement. I think that's all the questions we have today. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Greenberg. Um, thank you for holding a, our session today with Dental Shadowers. We greatly appreciate your time and effort to um, 
have your power presentation, PowerPoint presentation made and um, having you on today. Um, thank you to everyone that has joined um, on this live session. This session will be posted on YouTube. And if anybody wants to rewatch it, it's available to them. It will be uploaded tomorrow. If anyone has any last minute questions, concerns, you can put it in the chat. But otherwise, um, Dr. Greenberg's contact information is displayed on the screen right now if anybody wants to um, jot it down. Yep. But thank you again, I, Dr. Greenberg. Feel free to email me. You can text me if you have any concerns. Um, if you want to talk on the phone, like I said, just schedule on my site um, and we can kind of chat about where you're at in the process. Um, and yeah, good luck with everything, everyone. I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Well.